Welcome to this presentation, Wisdom from Some of the World's Best Coaches. My name is John Foreman. This presentation comes out of the work done in the Volleyball Coaching Wizards Project, which is something that myself and my partner, Mark Lebedew, started, uh, I think, about four and a half years ago now. Uh, Mark is currently the Australian men's national team coach and also coaches a professional team in the Polish Men's League. So just before I explain the structure of this presentation, let me fill you in on Volleyball Coaching Wizards in case you're not familiar with it. What Mark and I have done is interviewed, at this point, over 40 coaches from all around the world, from all sorts of different levels of play. So that includes people at the top level, international, national team coaches, high-level professional coaches, coaches in the college ranks, juniors coaches, high school coaches. You know, one of our in wizards these days is primarily working on uh, very young kids, even down in the four- and five-year-old age group. Uh, one of the wizards worked with uh, disabled players. Um, multiple wizards have, have worked with uh, on the beat side of things. So part of our motivation here is to, to cover the full spectrum of coaching, level-wise, location-wise, all that sort of thing. Um, and here's actually a list of, of at least most of the people that we've interviewed so far. Some names I'm sure you'll recognize, other names maybe not. But that's kind of part of the point of the project is to introduce you to some people who are doing really good things that maybe you never heard of, but yet you can still kind of learn from, maybe be inspired by. That's what the project is all about. It's not sharing a lot of technical sort of information. You're not going to get much in the way of drills and games and, and that sort of things out of it. But it's it's more about the thought process behind the decisions that go into what do you do at more of the micro level when you're deciding what you're going to do in practice today or you know, uh, what you're going to do specifically in your match in terms of strategy and those sorts of things. So, as I said, the this presentation comes out of the work for Volleyball Coaching Wizards, specifically the second book that we published, which is Volleyball Coaching Wizards, Wizard Wisdom. Uh, what, I've, what the book includes is uh, 15 topics that represent interesting concepts that were discussed in the, in the in the interviews that we've done uh, by different people at different points. At some points, it, you know, actually in a lot of cases, there's overlap. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of times, basically what we did was start with a quote that one of the wizards said in regards to a certain topic and then uh, spin off the discussion from there. So there's no way I could get through uh, all 15 topics in you know in the time allocated for this. So what I've done is selected uh, a chunk of them that I'll go through, and each one will start off with either the quote that the wizard made or part of a quote that the wizard made that inspired us to include that particular topic in the book, or the idea that came out of the discussion. Okay, so. Let me start with a topic that if you're an experienced coach, you'll probably find yourself nodding your head along with a bit, maybe smiling, uh, re recalling the early days of your career. But if you're in the early, in those earlier stages of your career, uh, having you know been a player relatively recently, maybe you still play competitively on one level or another, uh, even if it's competitive recreational ball, uh, this um, may give you some some new perspective on things that might help you uh, become more effective uh, and, and just have a better mentality about your coaching. And that's the idea of living, leaving your inner player behind. Now, this comes from our interview with uh, Canadian coach Glenn Hogue. Uh, you might have seen Glenn coaching the Canadian men's national team at the Olympics, where they had uh, one of their best performances ever in 2016, if not their best. He also coaches professionally in Europe. In his interview, he talked about something that he'd heard from Julio Velasco, who's world-famous coach, somebody we'd love to, to interview for the Wizards Project. Uh, and, and what Julio said is, to be a successful coach, you must kill the player inside of you. Now, that sounds a little bit violent, but let me try to explain what that means. As a player, everything is, is internally focused. You're basically 
you're self-focused, you're selfish to a degree of thinking, not in a negative way. That's I'm not trying to imply that this is a negative thing, only that it's the reality of the situation. And I'm also not trying to suggest that this is about being a bad teammate or anything like that. But the, the reality of being a player is that you have to, as a necessity, be focused on your play, your development, and all the stuff that goes along with it. As a coach, your focus is on external things. It's much, much less on you and much, much more on everybody around you, managing all the players, managing all the other people that are involved in your team or your program. The player has to primarily think about what's best for them. Again, understanding that being a good teammate is part of that. The coach, though, has to think about what's best for the team overall, everybody involved. And this is where there can be a little bit of a, of a, a conflict in that the coach's ego can, can get involved in here, and even sometimes the, the coach's perspectives on future progression in their career. And because coaches can, can get caught up in, in focusing on what's best for them as well. But the difference here in this conversation is that as a player, you're focusing on your performance, and that's how you contribute to the team. As a coach, you're focusing on the team's performance, which then reflects back on you as an individual. So if you want to be a successful coach and proceed as a successful coach, the group of players that you have on the team and all the people that are involved in the team otherwise have to perform to the optimum level. That's where your gain comes from. As opposed to, as a player, your gain comes from performing yourself at the highest level possible. Okay, so that's that's part of this killing the player inside sort of concept. Of course, a coach needs to also have a wider view of what it means to be a coach. Uh, most players have no idea how involved it is. They only ever see you or primarily only see you on the court. You know, maybe if it's a college team or, or, or you know, another team that travels together, then, of course, you'll, they'll see you in that context too. But they don't see all the stuff that you do in recruiting. They don't see all the stuff that you do in the office or w working with sponsors, if that's part of your role, or, or any of the other administrative things that happen. Uh, Kevin Hambly, when, after, shortly after he took the job at Stanford, was interviewed, I believe it was on the Net Live, and he commented that about 7% of his time is spent on the court. That means like 93% of, of his time as a college coach is stuff that most people don't see, but it's part of coaching. And a lot of players, you know, that that's the thing that kind of shocks them when they make the jump from, from player to coach, along with just the difficulties of, of trying to you know, bring players along and teach them and all that. But they don't realize all the other work that goes into it. Okay. So, the, and, and, and tied in with this is that the coach has a, a longer-term perspective in mind, generally speaking, than the player does. So, you know, the player is going to be upset about current results. And to agree, of course, the coach is too. But the coach has to, much more quickly, be thinking about what comes next. You know, whether that's from a training perspective, from a planning perspective, or whatever. So we have less time available to us to wallow in bad results or revel in good ones because, all right, our, you know, we have a, a little bit amount of time to do that, but then we have to shift gears and start looking ahead to, okay, you know, this is the things that we need to work on a training or here's the recruiting we need to do for next season, you know, whatever it might be in your context. Um, whereas players can get away with, holding on to stuff a little bit longer before they too have to, to shift gears. Now, all this said, you don't want to completely toss the player's perspective out. You still need to keep it in mind. And a big reason for this is you need to understand the impact of your decisions on the players. For example, scheduling. 
when do you schedule practices? When do you schedule meals? What are in those meals? Uh, anything that is that, that ties in with the players and their whole their lives, uh, because part of this is realizing that as much as volleyball for you could very well be a twenty four seven sort of thing, it's not for them generally speaking. If they're students, they have classes, they have homework, uh, social lives, all you know, all these things going on. If they're like a professional player, they probably have families. They may have other commitments they have to to do. So we have to keep that sort of stuff in perspective while we're coaching. And so there's where you really you you want to keep that that piece of the player alive inside you as a coach. And then the last thing is, and this is this is a, a point a lot of coaches struggle with is you have to realize that they aren't you. You were a certain way as a form, as a player or still are as a player, certain mentality, certain approach to the game, certain competitiveness. None of the players that you coach are exactly like you. They might be similar in certain ways and in other ways they're going to be completely different. So, Realize that as as part of your mentality, you can't get frustrated by that fact. You have to coach the players as they are. Obviously, thinking about how can we kind of nudge them in certain directions. You're not going to be able to push them there wholesale. I can just about guarantee you that. But you can move them over time in the direction of a mentality that you think is appropriate for them to be the most competitive, the most successful, and obviously to also filter up into the team's success overall. So just some things for you to think about in terms of shifting that mentality from player to coach. The next topic I want to talk about is the idea of being consistent as a coach. This comes from the interview that we did with Stelio Doraco. He's also a Canadian coach, but he coached the Australian national team when they hosted this, the Sydney Olympics. And he's been a professional coach uh, at different stops all over Europe uh, for quite a few years. And the, what he said, there's his quote from his interview, to be consistent in the way that you are on a daily basis so that when you walk into the court, people know that you're ready to work and then you've got a plan. You've got a purpose for being there. If you're energetic, then you've got to be energetic every day. If you're going to be a talker, you've got to be a talker every day. Okay, so basically... It's it's easy to think about consistency in terms of um, feedback, message, expectation, but what Stelio is is more focused on is your your mood and your projection, how you present yourself every single day, and this is important not just when you're talking with the team, but also when you're talking with whoever your your manager is athletic director, club director, president, supporters, the media, everybody. It goes for everybody. Um, and and there's a, a, a number of reasons why you need to be conscious of this sort of stuff and try to be as consistent as possible. And a big part of that is because mood is a two-way influence. You can feed off the mood of your players just as the players can feed off your mood and actually, the latter is is likely to be the much stronger influence because a group tends to reflect the mood of a leader. So if you go in and you're in a bad mood, the chances are you're going to see a session where the players are a little withdrawn. They're not perhaps as energetic as maybe they were. They don't talk as much as they were, those sorts of things, where if you're in a really positive mood, that's going to tend to, to lift the spirits of the players. And you know, and be engaging. So you don't want to be in a situation where you're bouncing their mood all over the place because they're reflecting your own mood coming at them. All right. And it's it's to joke a little bit. It's kind of like being part of a couple, with the old the old saying being that the two people in a couple can only be as as in as good a mood as the worst off of them. Uh, the, your team is going to be like that in practice, 
probably in matches as well when, based on your mood. Now, that doesn't mean they're always going to be quite as happy as you might want to be, but that's, you know, that's something else to, 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 to be thinking about. Um, this is also something that you want to think about in terms of the leaders of your team, team captains or, or, or whatever. Because again, as I said, the leaders of a team influence the mood of a team. So if your team leaders tend to be moody, one direction or the other, or both directions, then that's going to create some emotional influence issues in the team as well. So to the extent possible, you also want not only to be projecting a consistent mood yourself, you also want your your leaders to be presenting themselves in as, as consistent a mood as possible, preferably in a positive sort of way. Uh, mood also colors your perception of things. Generally speaking, if you're in a good mood, you're probably going to think positive thoughts about a practice session when it's over. Conversely, if you're in a negative mood, you're probably going to fixate on all the negative things that happen in a practice that day. Neither of those situations is ideal. Okay, you need to be obviously as objective as you possibly can be. Um, and also realize this can create feedback loops where you know your negative mood feeds into a negative practice which then just feeds into you being more negative about things or vice versa. Positive mood feeds into a positive practice, feeds into positive feelings about things. I think we'd much rather have the second than the, than the first. But as I said, each of them can have their own risks. So we're not talking about you having to be an entirely different person. What we're just tr talking about here is you trying to be a consistent person. Now, Part of this is understanding how to direct your emotions. Uh, and a big factor in that is, is making sure that you're not taking out your feelings, your issues, your whatever, onto your team. If there's something going on outside of the team that's causing you to have uh, stress, anger, whatever, you don't want to bring that into the team. You want to keep that away from the team as much as you can hum you know, humanly possible, because they don't have anything to do with it. Uh, and in order to do that, you need to realize what things trigger that sort of stuff in you so you don't inadvertently go off when you don't want to and, and have some sort of negative emotional impact on the group, all right? And also part, in, in, of this is understanding uh, how this this ties in with what's going on in matches because these can be practices tend not to be the most emotional time because it's not so much heat of the moment in the battle sort of thing but in matches obviously the emotions can be flying theirs yours the crowds everybody's and this is where you have to even be even more aware and Conscious of your body language, conscious of your tone, um, just overall understanding of what you need to bring to the team in terms of presentation, emotional stability, all that sort of stuff. Making sure that you're positively influencing them versus being a distraction or being something that causes them to withdraw, become tentative, ignore you. Uh, we've, all, we've certainly all seen those sorts of situations. Okay, and and that relates to focusing on what you can control. A lot of coaching, there's especially when it comes to putting the team out on the court and, and watching them play, we can't control that stuff, and we have to understand that. So to the extent that we can let go of the things that we can't control and focus only on what we can control, it'll be easier for us to keep those emotions from bouncing all over the place and presenting ourselves in a much more consistent sort of fashion to our teams. Okay, let's move on to the topic of building team chemistry. This subject came up in our interview with Sue Gazanski. Uh, Sue won multiple national championships as a college coach, has written a couple of books, and is all over the place, literally all over the world, doing coaching education work for USA Volleyball, for FIVB, and in a bunch of different roles. So in her interview, Sue had the following to say. 
I think the success of the program is based on your practices, and that's when you see the players the most. That's when you have the most influence on them. Success is built around good practices, and in that practice, you're building the team concept that everything with everything that you do. Really hard to be specific on that, but coaches think a lot of times that building a team is doing some of those team building activities where players go out socially and they do fun things together, which for some teams is really important. For other teams, it's really not that important. But I think that building a team, you're doing that in practice by how you're running your practices. Okay, so basically what Sue is saying here is that most of the work, the vast majority of the work that goes into having good team chemistry happens in the gym. It's a function of the way you work. So it's not about doing team building events. It's not about doing, say, an outward bounds thing, a confidence course, a ropes course, something along those lines. Yes, those can be fun experiences, but they don't do what you inherently are looking to do in terms of building team chemistry, which is to create the best functioning team on the court. So it's contextual. You want the players to work together to develop the trust between and amongst each other that is necessary for a good functioning team in the heat of battle. Um, so if you're doing things outside of the gym, that might do some stuff that, like I said, could be fun, it could be could be engaging and whatnot, but at the end of the day, it doesn't mean make your team play better in defense. It doesn't smooth out the rough patches in your transition offense and, and the things that you're you're concerned with. It's not developing the kind of trust that is the core of on-court chemistry, which is understanding of what each other is going to do in a situation, knowing the relationships between them, uh, who's going to take what ball, who's going to be available to, to be set in a given situation, that sort of stuff. Um, so how do you build this? Well, you start with your concept of how you want the team to play and how you want them to work. So you have an idea of the, the, the type of offense you'll use, the type of defense you'll use, the, the training methodologies that you'll have, the, 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 just the, the attitude that you're going to have in the gym while you're doing your work. Now, I'm not saying here that you must always run a 6-2 a system or a 5-1 system or a rotation defense or a middle-middle defense or whatever. All of that stuff can be adaptable based on the group of players that you've got, but you have a concept of, of how you want the team to play that you're working toward. And you have a concept of what you want to see that team doing in practice, and including yourself because everybody is involved here. But what that looks like, what that feels like in the day-to-day -day work, okay? So you're, you're, you're building your structure of play, um, who has different team responsibilities, what the, the transition points are going to look like in certain situations. You're, you're, you're working on those sorts of things as you're training. And, and you're also working on the communication. You're developing the methods of communication between players as, pa as part of the overall structure of you, how you're going to play. Because how they engage with each other on the court, whether it's during play or between plays or even on the sideline during timeouts, between sets, that sort of thing. All of that is stuff that you need to be consciously aware of and consciously working on continuously through through what you do in practice. That's the thrust of what Sue is basically saying in her quote. Um, now, a lot of what people think of as, as chemistry building stuff, as team building stuff, has to do with kind of developing interpersonal player relationships. And there there is an influence there, to be sure. And, and Sue brings it up. says so sometimes with some groups, they need to do things outside the gym that are, are social and so they can get to know each other. Uh, whereas other groups uh, don't necessarily need that as much. Uh, there, There's obviously value to these things in terms of it gets the players to know each other in a different context. 
and to to develop those relationships that can help out through a season to under you know understand what each other is going through where they're coming from that can maybe smooth out some communication issues that might develop along the way avoid potential conflicts that might come up that you know you could see in teams from time to time so that's that sue isn't obviously ruling out the idea of doing some of the these out of the gym sort of activities as as it suits the group of players that you have she's just making the, the observation that, that that isn't the the driver of what is what is going to be perceived by people looking at how your team plays you know as the, the, the that chemistry element how they work together on the court okay it can be could be a, an add-on factor to it but it's not at the end of the day going to be the factor that drives what's going on in the plays. So, and part of, and, and one of the things that you need to realize in all this is that there is a huge number of relationships involved in a team. Obviously, there's the there's the collection of everybody together as one group. But then you start breaking it down. There's all the individual relationships between players. There's small group relationships where you've got the dynamic of three people together. Now, how many of those, how many groups of three are there in your team? You've got six people playing together on the court at the same time. How many possible different combinations of that? So it's not, it's not really feasible for you to be thinking about how, you know, well, setting up social interactions that are going to address all of those varieties of different types of relationships that are going on. But they do happen necessarily in the course of training because of the way you mix players up in combinations for games, for drills, and all these sorts of things. So as you're working on the, the communication aspect and, and then the, the mode of work aspect of developing that team chemistry, you're also working on those interpersonal and group relationships at the same time. So just something to be aware of uh, in the whole thinking process here. And kind of the final point out of all this is building team chemistry isn't about any one thing that you do. It's about everything you do. Okay. And so it's, it's, it's holistic from that perspective. So keep that in mind as, as you think about this concept and, and how you, you're doing things in your own gym and with your own team. So the next up is knowing what's important in the moment. This comes from a quote from Craig Marshall's interview. Now, Craig is a longtime beach coach from Australia. Uh, he's coached in multiple Olympics uh, on the FIVB World Tour, all of that sort of stuff for a long time. I think for something like 20 odd years. Um, is the, the, the quote that we use in the book is actually quite a bit longer than this to try to provide a little bit more full context. But uh, rather than read that whole thing out, I'll, I'll focus on kind of the key thrust of it is the way I see it, you've got to be what's required in the moment. You know, you've got to be able to fit into that moment and deliver what's required. So, and there's, there's a few different kind of layers and elements to that. One of them is, is kind of the simplest is you need to know what's important right now. You need to know what your priority is right now. And that could change and it is going to change. It, it'll be different in preseason than it will be at the end of the season. It'll be different at one point of practice than it'll be at a different point of practice. It'll be different working with one player than it will be working with another player or one group and working with another group. So all of these things, you have to have a functional awareness of, okay, what's the priority right now so that you can, you can be focusing on the most important thing right now, whatever that happens to be, and have the discipline to realize these other things are not as important. I don't want to spend time on them before I address the top priority. All right. Uh, and then uh, perhaps the, the biggest thing that Craig explicitly mentions in the, the longer version of that snippet that I, that I shared is the idea of having empathy. And he specifically references the Brene Brown TED Talk on vulnerability, uh, which is, if you haven't seen it, uh, to go look it up on YouTube. Brene, Brene Brown, vulnerability. She's also got a, uh, a special, like an hour and 15 or something like that on Netflix. So you can find it there. 
and they're both worth watching. Um, she's become kind of very well known for her talks about people needing to have vulnerability, especially people in, in management roles. And it ties in with the idea of empathy. You know, it's understanding what somebody else is going through and being able to see what they need from you in, a, in that particular moment. Now, there is there is an interesting counter to the vulnerability side of things, and that's the idea that as a coach, there are times when it's okay to be vulnerable and necessary even, and that's what Brene Brown will make the argument of, but there is also times when you need to project confidence. Um, and I actually, I listened to a podcast recently on Econ Talk, uh, which I know it doesn't sound like it has anything to do with volleyball, but it, it was basically what it was, was uh, uh, a guy who would run a bunch of businesses. So he'd been a manager, an owner, that sort of thing. And, you know, he had, he had listened to the Brene Brown stuff and, and he had, you know, some concerns about it from a kind of a situational perspective. And it's related to what does the person need in the moment. And he described a story where uh, I don't remember if it was him doing this or if it was he was referencing another manager that was in the situation. But uh, a, a woman came to him that was one of his uh, reports, and she was she was concerned about the the, the where the where the business was going, and and it was clear that there were some elements in her life that were causing her some uncertainty. And so she was looking for uh, a sense of stability in the business environment and in her, in her work environment to understand that, you know, this was, this was going to be a stable situation. She wasn't going to have to worry about having to go look for a new job or, or something like that. And the manager in that moment was being truthful and being honest and being realistic and saying, you know, well, hey, you know, I've got these situations and this could happen and that could happen. But that not realizing that's not what she needed in the moment. So the end result was she left the company to go work for somewhere else where obviously she must have perceived that there was more stability. So it was a failure of that manager's, you know, re realization in the, in the moment of what that employee needed at that moment. So this speaks to understanding, okay, yes, there's, you know, you have the empathy, you look at what they, they're looking for. And sometimes you need to be the vulnerable manager. And sometimes you need to be the confident, assuring manager and being able to, 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 to differentiate which side of that fence you need to fall on in a given moment. And that's where it all kind of comes down to. You need to be ready to do what's needed now in whatever situation you have to be in and for a lot of us that means we need to develop new sets of skills because it isn't always going to go right down to what we know already what we've experienced already we're we're going to get thrown up against things that we haven't been through before and sometimes that'll be in a positive way which is great and sometimes it's not going to be in a positive way and you know it's going to be painful and you're going to have to deal with some really awkward stuff uh, and some of us have already have already been through that so as you think about your own development as a coach, make sure you're thinking beyond, hey, I need to find a drill to help my team do better in service, Eve, or I need to uh, learn more about how to run the middle, middle defense or whatever that are kind of the technical, tactical sorts of things and, and expand your thinking in terms of what other skills do I need to develop or expand so that I'll be prepared to help my team, my players in situations that are probably going to come up at some point in my coaching career. Okay. So just uh, having a wider perspective on, on where you take yourselves and your education. All right. The next topic is coaching from the bottom up. And this comes from the Giovanni Gudetti interview. Uh, uh, some of you are aware of Giovanni. Arguably at this point, he might be the best coach in the world. He was the Dutch Net Women's National Team coach in Rio 2016. It took him to the semifinals. Uh, he's since uh, shifted over to the Turkish national team and has some, some really, really good results with, with Turkey in you know, the big international competitions. Uh, he's also the head coach of the one of the top clubs in Turkey, Vakifank, 
Warriors were won Champions Leagues. He's won World Cup championships, league titles, all that sort of stuff. His his resume is a mile long. And he said in his interview, among many other things, at the at the end, a, a team has to become a team to perform. How you do that? I think the very first important part that I try to put in my head always every day is that the less important player of the team is the one that has to have the most attention from me. Okay. So he's, he's talking about this idea that in order to keep everybody engaged and connected in the team, the, he needs to be thinking about players, you know, nine, 10, 11, 12 on his bench and about staying in communication with them a lot more probably than he talks to his starters, for example. Starters get a lot of attention inherently. They get it from the tr- the press. They get it from the supporters. They get it from people, you know, if you're a college coach, you get it from people on campus. You get it from your teammates. And and you get it from the coach just because you inherently are engaging with them, say, in the match setting and probably in training as well in working through their roles as starters. The those people lower down the the roster, they're not getting the attention from the external sources that the starters are getting. They're not getting the in-match sort of engagement that the starters are getting from the coach. So Giovanni's making the point that he tries to balance that out by giving extra attention and engagement to those non-starters to make sure that they remain connected and engaged with the team overall. All right, so it's kind of a sense of proportional attention. More to the people who aren't getting it just in the normal course of things, less to the people who are already getting it. Now, we can kind of tie this into the idea of of allocating playing time. And this was a conversation that came up in uh, Vital Heinen's interview a little bit. Vital is the, currently the Polish men's national team coach who, who won the most recent world championships. His philosophy is he tries to find a, a way to get every player into every match, if at all possible. It might just be as a serving sub. Obviously, they're playing under FIVB rules, so what he can do in a substitution perspective is quite limited compared to what can be done in the U.S., where you've got much more opportunity to make subs and much more flexibility. But he sees this as rather than, say, giving somebody a, this, you know, a match start periodically, he's trying to keep them engaged constantly by making sure that they're involved in every single match. Now, that's depending on your situation, that may or may not be something that's, that's realistic for you, but it's something that you can think of. It's, it's part of the process of making sure that all of your players are locked into and and feel a part of what you're doing with the team overall. And that it's not just about the six players on the court in any given situation. The the other point that, that Giovanni brings into this discussion, and it's not included in that particular quote that I've got, but it's it's in the more expanded version that, that I didn't touch on here, is going beyond and outside the team when you you, ha- you you think in terms of who I need to engage with. He actually uses specifically the example of the guy who comes in and sets that sets up and takes down the nets in the gym every day, and he makes sure that he engages with that with that guy, you know, on a on a regular basis. You could think of that in terms of, you know, the janitor that that cleans your gym or the people who take tickets for your matches or the administrator that's overseeing game day management. You know, there's any number of people that are probably involved with your team in some fashion or another. And you want them to feel a part of your program as well. Obviously, they're not playing and you're probably not you, you're not seeing them as much as you're seeing your team. Some of them maybe you see every day. Some of them maybe you only see sporadically. But the, the idea is the more that they feel a part of what the program is doing overall, the, the, the more positive, obviously, they're going to view things, and most likely the more probable they're going to be helpful if a situation comes along. Uh, my partner, Mark, uh, coached in Germany, and I don't know if he, he still sees this as a situation in Poland, but he described as when you 
when you coach in Germany, there's what they call a Hallmeister, who's basically the guy who's in charge of the sports hall that they use for their training and for their matches. And you want to be in good with that, with the Hallmeister, because they're the ones who determine training schedules and what's available and how you can set up the gym, what you can use in the gym and all these sorts of things. So if they feel like you're brushing them off, not taking them seriously, whatever, then chances are there's, you know, they're not going to necessarily do you any favors when maybe you need something a little bit unusual, need some help in a certain way. So that's, you know, that's all part of how you, you need to think about, you know, in, in, keeping everybody involved in your team and your program in, engaged and in, in, in feeling like they have a part of the success that you're trying to bring to it. Also coming from Vital, and this wasn't part of his interview, but it's, it's part of, um, it's kind of what he does if you pay uh, any attention to him. He takes this idea of coaching uh, not just the players, but coaching everybody else, coaching the fans, coaching the the, the management, so that he can kind of, he can not manipulate, but certainly influence perceptions. And it, it, there's kind of a a balance there between you know the sense of you got to be realistic on the one hand, but you also need to project an ambition and an optimism on the other hand. So it's, it's kind of like managing the management or managing the fans sort of idea, which is something to, that you need to take seriously. If you're in a sort of situation where you've got people that can, you know, influence your, your working environment, your career prospects, uh, whether you're going to stay in your job or not. So again, just one more way of, of thinking bigger than just the, the players that you've got on your team. Okay, so the next topic I want to talk about is the psychology of practice. This concept comes from the interview we did with Anders Christensen, who's a Swedish coach who won a ridiculous number of championships in the, in the leagues in Sweden, was the Swedish national team coach when they took silver at European championships. I believe that was 1989. Uh, he coached uh, at Mosaic in Belgium. Um, for those of you who listen to the Net Live, uh, you may have heard Kevin Barnett talk about his time at Mosaic, and Christensen was actually Kevin's coach in those days. These days, Anders uh, coaches in Japan, where he's also had quite a bit of success. He makes the comment in, in his interview, you also have to think of the psychological factor. If you're working too much with a problem area, you have to at least consider that the player might get worse. If you put it too much as a problem, I mean, that's why, I mean, the psychological factor is also something that you have to involve in your training. You have to think about that without saying now we are practicing mental training, but you have to think about this factor. So there's a, a few things that we can tease out of uh, Andrew's comment here. And the first is, is this concept of, of a spotlight. Now, any time that we as coaches put our focus on something, when we're talking about it to the team or we're talking about it to individual players, we are inherently spotlighting that thing. And this could be positively or negatively. Obviously, in this case, Anders is, is, try, is concerned with the idea that maybe we're putting too much of a negative spotlight on things. So we're, we're focusing too much on uh, weaknesses. You know, um, we're not good in reception. We need to be better in attack, that sort of stuff. And it's it's a function of the language that we use, which can obviously go both ways. And it's it tends to be a, cum a cumulative effect, although it can be it can be in the moment as well. But when we're thinking in terms of the team, oftentimes it's not what you say one day of practice, but it's where you keep the spotlight continuously in practice. So if you're constantly working on uh, service eve or service eve offense or, or, you know, whatever, and you're talking about it in terms that could be construed as we're not good at this, then that's creating a neg negative spotlight. And over time, that's going to create a, a negative mentality about it. 
and it's it's kind of like self the team self talk. So obviously we you you understand the concept of self talk in terms of a player, you know, having you know either positive or negative self talk, and how that influ- that can influence their performance, the training, and all that stuff. The same thing can be true when we look at the team overall, and if as the coach we're encouraging either a positive or a network a, a, a negative spotlight on something, especially continuously, then that's a form of team self-talk. If we're constantly addressing things in terms of this is a weakness, this is a weakness, this is a weakness, then inherently it's going to get internalized and that's going to be a negative self-talk. Whereas you could flip it around and you could talk about positive things. We're really good at this. We're really good at this. We're really good at this. There's some positive self-talk. So it can, the spotlighting idea can go both ways. And it plays into the idea of team identity. Uh, every team has some kind of identity. Some are much more firmly established than others, especially teams and programs that have you know, been around for a while, have some history. Uh, obviously tougher with a team that's just newly formed, but eventually they will they will develop an identity. What you say and how you say it influences that identity. So you have the ability to c- control the narrative in that regard. What identity do you think the team should have? Well, you could work the team in that direction. What's an identity you want to make sure the team doesn't have? Work the team away from that direction. Um, and you could also, if you're not careful, cause a loss of identity by overly focusing on other things and not continuing to focus on the things that are part of that identity. And my partner, Mark, um, kind of has an example of this from his own coaching, where one season he had a team that basically their identity was they were very good in transition. They weren't so great in in side-out offense, but they were very good in dig transition scoring. He wanted to get better at the side outside of things. So he said they worked on it relentlessly for a couple of weeks. But at the end of the day, he found that they were slipping on the transition side of the game. They were losing their identity. So what he finally decided that he needed to do was go back to keeping the focus on the point scoring side of things, the the the, the transition side of things, and just kind of let serve receive take care of itself because it was changing the internal dynamic of the team and how they identified themselves and and it was causing them to perform not as well yes they were a bit better and and side out but that was offset by the loss of the identity on the transition side of things so something to to keep in mind in, in terms of where you direct your your training focus and also how you communicate stuff now of course, anything that influences the, the team also has the potential to influence the player, and in particular, the confidence of the player. And this is also something that, that we could talk about in terms of direct, because on one level, it's it's kind of a cascade down. If we talk about how we're not good at serve receive, then the players that are involved in this will take that as a kind of a knock-on with regards to their own performance. Oh, you know, we means me. We means us. Uh, I'm not good at this. It can also mean, though, however, that you could be talking to the player directly and using language that's going to cause issues. <clears throat> For example, um, you can say things which implies that the player is broken in some way. We need to fix whatever it might be. And this is especially a problem if you're talking about something that the players, and this goes to the team as well, consider they do perfectly fine or well, and you come in and say, we need a fix. Well, you're going to have an inherent resistance there, uh, which can cause trust problems. So, you know, if you're going to work with a player and they feel like they're a good attacker, they get you know, they get plenty of kills. They don't make a lot of mistakes. But there's something that you see that you don't like, you think could be fixed, could be improved, whatever. 
if you address it as we need to fix your arm swing, for example, and they don't understand that it's about getting better, and they just see you attacking something that they think they're already good at. So inherently, that's going to be there's going to be some kind of pushback. They're going to lose potentially lose confidence in you as a coach, and it could be an outright rejection, and it's a rejection that could carry over to other parts of the game. Well, you could completely lose the player, and if it's a meaningful player, you could completely lose the group. And this, you know, goes to the same sort of situation with a team. If the team thinks they're good in a certain area, and you start coming in with the language of fix, 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 that implies that it's not good it's broken, it's bad, then there's a good chance you're going to get resistance, which you don't want. So we need to consider the language that you use in that regard. And also and important in this is the idea of acknowledging progress. Players and teams aren't necessarily good at seeing their improvement over time. It's, it's imperative for you as the coach to make sure that you point that out. Hey, look how much better we are at this. Look how much better we are at that. Or you are individually. That's something that helps build confidence individually and collectively. So the question is, you know, how do we how do we avoid this kind of negative spotlighting and work in a way that we don't get resistance if it's if it's something they think they're good at, or we we don't create a, a drop in confidence or a change in a negative change in team identity. And there's, there's a couple ways you could do that. One is you simply don't mention what you're doing or why you're doing it. Okay, you think the team needs to improve in, in side-out phase of the game. Well, you can train in the side-out phase of the game without really talking about why you're doing it. You just do it. Alternately, you can keep the talk kind of neutral with respect to any value judgments. Hey, I want to work on side-out offense today. And that's it. You don't say because we're not very good at it, because we need to get better at it, or any any sort of thing that would attach a value to it. In that way, you keep things neutral. And in certain situations, you might even be able to, to spin it in a positive way. You know, um, all right, well, we, we, I'm going to walk on side art offense today. We're really good in this phase. Let's see if we can bring this other phase up to a comparable level. Something along those lines. So it's it's less framing things in a negative light and potentially framing them in a positive light if you need to frame them at all. And keep in mind in all of this that all of these things apply just as much to you as a coach as they do to the team. Because if you're constantly spotlighting your own stuff in a negative way, then that's going to influence your confidence as a coach. And coaches are just as prone to having problems driven by confidence issues as players are. We may not be on the court, but we we suffer some of the some very similar sort of uh, mental uh, influences in doing our jobs. So as you're thinking about this in terms of how you're developing your, your practice plans and how you talk about the things that you're working on in practice with the teams and with the players, keep it in mind for the things that you're doing for yourself as well. Okay, the last segment of this uh, presentation is this idea of coaching to the performance. It comes from the interview we did with uh, Wizard Joel Deering, who is a longtime Division III, NCAA Division III coach for the Springfield College in Springfield, Massachusetts. Most of Joel's time there was spent with the women, but he also coached the men for several years. And if you know anything about uh, men's college volleyball in the U.S., you probably are aware that Springfield College is, is one of the powerhouse Division III programs in the U.S. Joel's comment on this, this idea of coaching of the performance is, is as follows. I try to be very consistent in my approach and demanding in the sense that when, we, when a match started, again, we had a specific performance objectives that were laid out. We might be at 10-7. I'm calling a timeout because I've got some data in front of me. And I'm like, look, we need to pay attention to something. Here's where we are in that in this set. So he's talking about not just focusing on the scoreboard, but focusing on how you're actually doing. 
uh, and, and in this case, he actually specific, specifically mentions maybe he's got some stats or some data of some kind that he's looking at to keep tabs on things and, and that might come into the factor as to, you know, what he's talking to his team about. So in, in, in broader terms, we could kind of think of uh, four elements of this coaching to the performance and how it might play out in your own coaching. And the first part um, is this idea of what the coach's value is during a match. We asked a lot of the Wizards in their interviews the question, what's more important in your coaching? Is it coaching in practice or is it coaching during match time? And the, and the vast majority of them say it's coaching during practice because that's what sets up the performance in matches. Red Bad Strick Werda, the Dutch coach, actually contradicted that by saying, no, it's actually, it's match day coaching. And the kind of the reasoning behind that was there's there's not a lot of things that you can do positively to help your team during match day. Yeah, you might be able to help them with a point here or a point there if you see something on the other teams, the way the other team's playing, or maybe, you know, you work a little bit in terms of the strategy with your team and things like that. But most of what you do from that perspective is setting the lineups, deciding substitutions, and that sort of thing. What you can do, though, is you can have a huge negative impact if you get things wrong. That could be something as simple as just messing up, putting in the lineup. That could cost you a set, which could potentially cost you a match. I think most of us have probably made mistakes putting lineups in. I know I've certainly done it on multiple occasions. Uh, you know, if you're lucky, it doesn't end up hurting you. If you're unlucky, it can cause a big problem. You can also just get it wrong in terms of your management of the, of an individual player or the team overall. I've certainly watched coaches completely put their teams out of sorts with the, with the way they manage things during a match. Uh, maybe you have to, maybe you've, even, you've experienced it yourself. That can cost you big chunks of points. It could cost you sets. It could potentially cost you a match. So Red Bad's argument is there's a lot more downside risk in terms of what a coach does on match day than there is upside value, which is something that we as coaches need to be aware of and to be uh, you know, cognizant of in terms of how we behave, how we act. All right. The the second part of this this overall idea is is the purpose of our interventions as coaches. And when we use the term interventions, we're talking about the things that we can do during matches to to try to influence things like timeouts and substitutions. And if you're in a situation where you can do it, challenges, that sort of thing. A lot of this has to do with, as Joel would say, emotional regulation of your team um he's he's expressing the idea that you know his job as coach is to try to keep his team in a good emotional state so that they can perform at their optimum not too high not too low whatever is, is going to be best for them to achieve their objectives a lot of coaches talk about using timeouts as a, as an as a chance to try to influence momentum and the psychology of a match so along this similar set of, of lines. And you can do that with substitutions, maybe trying to put in a player that you might think will, will spark the team or take out a player who's maybe dragging the team down a little bit emotionally, that sort of thing. Trying to slow matches down with, with challenges and substitutions and all that. These are all tricks uh, of influence by way of intervention. Okay, uh, the next aspect of this is what you're looking at during a match. And this comes in a couple of different uh, aspects. One of them is what exactly is the objective that you've got in mind? What is the most important thing for you to take away from this match? Are you trying to win? So is it a performance thing? Or is it more a developmental situation? If you're a juniors coach, especially with young kids, it could very easily be more of a developmental thing. If you're a high school coach or a college coach, a professional coach or whatever, and the objective is to to win, then obviously you're thinking more in terms of the the performance side of things, uh, in terms of you know scoring points and and all of the stuff that goes into that. 
So that's one aspect of are you are you looking at things during the match in terms of your objective? Because it's very easy, especially if you're in a in a, like if you're supposed to be taking a training mentality, it, it's very easy for you to get caught up in the winning and losing aspect of things when you're not really supposed to be doing that. And at the same time, there's a risk if you're trying to focus on performance that you could get caught up in, in more of a training mentality and and coaching players from that perspective throughout the match, which again can have some some negative consequences. The other kind of idea of, of what you're looking at during the match is is where you're putting your attention in terms of you know the ways you, that you think you can help your team get its best performance. You know, is that looking at them? Is that looking at the other team? Is that focusing on offense and or on defense? How you, you know how do you split that out if you've got a staff? You know who's got which responsibilities and who's going to be talking to the team or in, or groups of players or whatever during the match in those regards. And 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 tying that stuff into where it feeds into their performance, obviously in a, in a fashion that you think is going to get the most out of them. All right. The final thing that I'll bring up here is the idea that you can, it is possible to be overprepared. Now, obviously it's important to prepare for a match. You know, it, it could be a situation where you do things in training that gets you ready for the match. If it's a situation like say you're coaching a, a team where you, you know, or you play one or two matches during a week, like on the weekend or something like, and you can use the week to, to train and get ready for this, the upcoming match or matches. That's obviously one side of it. Another side of it is from you as a coaching uh, point of view is, you know, what are the things that you're going to be setting up? You know, what are your plans for given scenarios that might come to pass? So yeah, that stuff is important, but that there just needs to be an understanding that sometimes you can overdo it. And I'll use myself as an, as an example. When I coached in Sweden, there was a match where I wanted to get our backup setter in just to get, you know, some more experience and keep her, keep her focused and motivated and all that. And I had a scenario in mind where I wanted to, to bring her in. Unfortunately, that scenario just never came to pass. It didn't happen. Meanwhile, there was another scenario that did happen that I could have used to get her in. But because I was so locked into the, the one that I had in mind, I didn't even think about the, the secondary one. I just didn't allow myself the dynamic thought process because I had, I had been too rigid in my, my preparation. So that's just, you know, a cautionary sort of tale. It's, it's possible to, to do too much in this regard and, and lock yourself in and not allow the flexibility that you need to, to get the most out of the situation when the opportunities do actually present themselves. So that's, that kind of wraps up this, this idea of, uh, performance and it wraps up this overall uh, presentation and like I said at the beginning there was no way that I was going to be able to get through all of the material in the book I don't I don't think we even got through halfway so there's plenty of stuff left in the book and I encourage you to give it a read uh, if you want to get a print version which seems to be the most popular you can get that uh, currently available on Amazon uh, it's uh, certainly on Amazon in the US and Canada and I think throughout Europe uh, other places you'll have to check in your local store because it changes. Um, it, you know, it depends on Amazon's printing capability in your local region. Uh, beyond that, of course, you can get the electronic version. Go to volleyballcoachingwizards.com and look for the books tab in the menu. And you can find the book and you can find uh, where you can get it. Uh, obviously, if you've got Kindle, you can get it on Amazon, but you can also get it through Apple. You can get it through Google. You can get it through a bunch of other uh, uh, stores as well. It depends on, on what you want. And you can find out more information generally at volleyballcoachingwizards.com. Uh, if you want to follow my own blog where I could talk, uh, talk about coaching ideas and concepts, coachingvb.com. That's me. My partner, Mark Lebedew, uh, has his own blog where he talks about coaching and also just broader volleyball, uh, ideas and thoughts and throws in some analytic stuff as well from time to time. And that's, like I said, marklebedew.com. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. We'd love to hear from you with any questions, comments, things like that.